Welcome. My name is Dennis Kucera. I'm the Applications Engineer from the MPEG product line. I'm here today to give a brief introduction of the MTS4EA version 7, which now includes high efficiency video codec, or H.265, as well as other previously included codecs such as MPEG-4, MPEG-2, and so on. All right, so two important things that we want to point out with this application software is its ability to guarantee interoperability between any encoder and any decoder. And the way that we do that is follow syntax and semantics rules. And what we do is for every encoder, whether it's MPEG-4 or H.265, we look at the available commands in that codec library and how they are to be spelled out, how they are to be used, and what parameters can be used with them. By that, we make sure that the syntax and semantics meet the codec standard, and if that's the case, approved by the application software, the actual video should be fully decoded and represented by any set-top box it claims to be compliant. A second important point about this application software is its ability to measure how many bits per frame are being used, as well as how many bits per block or coding block or unit are being used. This is critical because if you spend too much time or too many bits in the wrong places, you can end up creating poor video quality. To make these points, we're going to show two examples. The first one will pull up from a predefined sample from the software called MPEG-4 Weather Girl, and we'll step through looking for verification, syntax, semantics, and specifically looking for, in this case, uh, alert problems with memory. Then we'll go in and look at each of the individual blocks to see how much information is being used. We'll look to make sure what type of frame it is, whether it's an I, B, or P, and then how much information is used in the background and foreground for coding the videotape, and then point out what happens when you have tickers running along the bottom, whether they be from sports or uh, stock information. All right, for the first example, we mentioned we were going to load a predefined file from the application software called Weather Girl, and we'll do that from the file pull-down menu, examples, and pick up the MPEG-4 video program, which also includes audio. And here we have the Weather Girl, followed by the audio because it's a system file. So let's focus on the video first. So now we've stepped in one frame, so we're looking at frame number one, and it's highlighted at the bottom right-hand corner. Frame number two, and we can see just a slight bit of movement of the lady's shoulders. And when we get to frame number three and four, we can see that we violated one of the rules. In this case, it's a buffer memory issue. We're using too much memory. This is going to be an interoperability problem for a variety of set-top boxes, not those that have excessive memory, mainly because the standard only specifies a minimum amount. So this is critical in catching uh, semantic and syntactic errors, including memory overflow. Here in the alert log, we can also see which frame the alert started in and a descriptive detail of what the problem was, memory overflow for the VBV. So the next thing that we're doing here is enlarging the file just so that we can fill the screen and get a better idea of what we're looking at. We're going to overlay for each one of the macro blocks in the background how many bits are being used per macro block, and that's a 16 by 16 group of pixels. Here we can see it looks like it's an iframe because every single macro block has something in it, and we can see the first macro blocks using 71 bits. Hopefully these won't move much in the background since the background doesn't move. The summary tooltip will tell us how many bits and bytes are being used, as well as it is an anchor frame or an iframe. So now let's step forward and look at the second frame and the third frame. What we're looking at here is how many bits or bytes are being used, and there's, there's nice areas where no bits are being used, and you'd expect that because the background's not moving. There are some areas 
in the background that probably shouldn't be using any bits but are because of uh, the way the frame is being filtered. We are also noticing bits and bites being used around the lady's head and shoulders. So that's the key area where we're expecting the data to be uh, used more intensively. Now along the bottom of the screen, sometimes when you have a ticker or sports scores or stock prices, depending on the font and how fast they're moving, you may end up seeing an inordinate amount of memory being used for recreating that little bit of video on the bottom. This is an excellent application for viewing how many bits are being used on the entire video frame as well as where they are being used. In this case, they're evenly distributed except for some occasional background areas using too many bits. Now for the second and more important example, we'll be opening up a file pulled off the web that was encoded with a high efficiency video codec system, also known as H.265. This particular file is the BQ mall scene and we'll go ahead and because of space restrictions, reposition the video and a couple of the other graphs so that we can get video on the right and some of our graphics functions such as the group of pictures and coded distribution units on the left. So we'll do that by positioning the video frame, then selecting the group of pictures, moving it to the lower left hand corner and this will allow us to identify anchor frames, I frames, B frames and P frames. And then for each one of the individual frames, we'll break that framing information down to what type of uh, CTUs or blocks are being used to build up each one of those frames. We won't always use 64 by 64s, but we would like to see the relationship between how many 64 by 64 blocks there are versus how many 8 by 8s. Now before we step into it, We'll also add, as we did in the previous example, an overlay of how many bits per CTU are being used. Then we will also go ahead and add a debug page so that we can go back and look at the individual protocol that was used to make up each one of these. And then finally enabling the trace function in case we want to step through and see what type of commands were being used to build up each one of the frames. So at this point we've set everything up. Now let's step through the first frame. So here's the summary of frame number one and we can see each of the 64 by 64 areas, how many bits are being used and then in the left side we can see of that block how many of, the, how many of those blocks are 64 by 64 total or how many of them are smaller such as uh, 8 by 8s. So what we're going to do here is we're going to scale down this ax the y axis so that we can see the relationship between the large blocks and the smaller blocks. And once we scale it down we can see that the majority of this first CTU is made up of 8 by 8s. So the first frame is a green anchor frame or an I frame. Let's go ahead and step through the second frame, third frame and so on and see what the makeup or distribution is of each one of these individual frames. We can see as we step through the background is not moving and not only that, the number of bits per CTU being used there in some cases are zero, which is a very good thing. In the lower left hand corner, the number of bits per frame you can see is dropping dramatically because we've already got the background replicated and we don't need to keep drawing it over and over. So there's a great amount of bandwidth savings. As we see people moving from the right to the left, going across the screen, we'll be using up some number of bits. We also, because we, the way we configured the setup, we'll be storing each one of these amount of blocks or bytes onto a comma delimited format file and as we're completing, we'll go ahead and look at the uh, Excel spreadsheet and see where the bandwidth is being used. So here's the trace function that we enabled earlier. We can step through every single command one at a time. We can step through frame by frame. We can even step through looking for specific words that make up each one of the individual frames. In this case here, we've, we've highlighted only frames, so we'll step from frame one to frame two to frame three, and all of the commands, syntax and semantics that were used to create that video picture are stored here in this text display. 
Lastly, we'll open up the graph function, which will take our pre-stored information, the number of bits per CTU that we were writing. We'll open up the Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, enable the macro, and it'll build up a three-dimensional database of one overlaid frame, which includes every single frame that we stepped through, which may have only been three or four or five, but for each one of those 64 by 64 areas, we can see the z-axis on how many bits were being used. And in the upper left-hand corner, virtually zero, but in the middle of the screen, you can see where people were walking from the right side to the left side, that there was a large number of bits, as you would expect. So if you were to use this function and see some of the cells were grossly out of proportion, there could be something wrong with the way the codec was engineered or how the software was handling the bits that it was seeing coming through on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. So that concludes the summary and overview of the new MTS4E8 version 7, including the new HEVC codec, as well as the H.265 and then also using in tandem the Microsoft Excel application. Thank you.